Uh, well, we are going through the book of Judges starting this year. So if you want to pull out your Bible, you can turn to Judges chapter 4, or you can look on that on your phones. But as you are turning there, you know, there's been a lot of TV shows over the years that have been bad, terrible, gross. I think the worst one ever has been the show called Fear Factor. I don't know if any of you watched the first round of this or it came back again later, I think a couple of years ago. Um, you know, the pr premise basically was let's take people's biggest, grossest, most terrible fears, let them experience that and film them so we can all watch it together, right? Uh, you know, just because I felt like I'm going to talk about it and I had to, I went to YouTube and just searched Fear Factor. And of course, the top results are like, the worst Fear Factor TV shows are like the worst possible ones. And they're all like, have to do with bugs or snakes or water or I don't know. Anybody, you've seen this show, right? Fear Factor, right? I'm, I'm just kind of curious. Is there anybody crazy enough here that would have gone on the show Fear Factor? Okay, I think just Russ. That was it. <laughs> Okay, uh, Joe, you wouldn't join him. We wouldn't join Russ. You, <laughs> Joe and Russ would do it. Our our big Vikings fans. Um, I I don't know if I could do it, guys. Just imagine that your biggest, darkest, most terrible fear, and you got to do it. Oh, you do it too. Okay, thanks, Trevor. <laughs> On TV for all to see, and you have to experience that. In our chapter this morning, our two chapters this morning, we're going to hear this word over and over again that the people of Israel are afraid of. It's one of their biggest fears. And God puts it in front of them, something they've experienced before even, God has overcome for them. But it keeps coming up in their minds like, what, what about this? But this is going to, this thing right here. And for you, it's probably not your biggest fear or something you're very worried about. But the word that they're afraid of is chariots. Chariots of iron. This word comes up over and over and over again, these two chapters. And they are freaked out about chariots and this army that is coming at them. And what they're going to do about that. I kind of explain a little bit in uh, communion, the book of Judges. We, we started this last week. We're going to kind of spend six or seven weeks doing this. It's kind of an odd book maybe for a new year to, to start if you're, you're new here or new to the Bible. This is in the Old Testament. It's got a very boring name, Judges. It sounds like people are being judgmental or maybe it has a, a gavel and a wig. Or, um, it's, it's about this period of time in Israel where there was no government or, or good leadership. And so every once in a while, a person would be risen up by God or on their own to lead and take over. These were who the judges were. But it's a, a book about leadership, about interacting with sin in the culture and how do you deal with that, about passing on the faith to the next generation, and idolatry. The very last verse of Judges says this, In those days there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. That's our theme for this series, In Their Own Eyes. We find ourselves, I think, again in that same situation where we live in a culture, we live in a place where, you know, whatever... Whatever you want to be right is right. Whatever goes, goes. It feels right. You should do it. And as Christians, we are called to live differently for a reason. It doesn't always feel good in the moment or look good, but we are called to live differently. And so we're going to read this morning about a number of people that chose to live different in the midst of this no king time period. So 
So Judges chapter 4, and we'll start with just verses 1 to 3 to kind of set us up to see where we are. Now, if you're taking notes this morning, um, I have on the screen your bulletin. There's three, three kind of main points today. Number one, Deborah versus Barak versus Sisera. You'll see these names come up soon. But Deborah versus Barak versus Sisera. Verse 1. And the people of Israel again did what was evil in the sight of the Lord after Ehud died. And the Lord sold them into the hand of Jabin, king of Canaan, who reigned in Hazor. The commander of his army was Sisera, who lived in Heresheth Hagoim. Then the people of Israel cried out to the Lord for help, for he had 900 chariots of iron. And he oppressed the people of Israel cruelly for 20 years. So here is our setup. Last week, we saw that the book opens with another death. The great leader Joshua, who the book before is named for, who led the people out of wandering in the desert for 40 years, finally led them to the promised land, he dies. And there's this question of who, who will lead us, what's going to happen. And God raised up these different people. He raised up a guy named Othniel, and then a guy named Ehud, who we saw here. But Ehud dies. And last week we saw that things begin to go bad when a leader dies. Sometimes that the, the next generation doesn't quite get the same message or the, the parents don't pass on the faith. So there's this, this, this opportunity here, but they again did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. We're going to see that this is um, worship of other gods, idolatry. They cry out to God because there are chariots of iron. This is so interesting. This, this chariot thing has come before in the Bible. In fact, they should remember this, that when they were fleeing from Pharaoh out of the Exodus, Pharaoh goes after them with chariots. And God stops the chariots because it's muddy out. And they get stuck in the mud and then stuck in the water that overcomes them finally. But they are afraid of these iron chariots. Now, I, I don't have much experience with chariots or iron chariots. I don't know if you have. My most experience that I have with iron chariots is with the movie Gladiator. And I've learned from the movie Gladiator, unless you have like a Maximus on your team, you're probably going to get destroyed if you're just like a soldier or a bunch of soldiers because iron chariots can just run through you. That's the fear they have here, that there's somebody that's coming to attack them, that's oppressing them, and they have 900 chariots of iron. So what happens? Verse 4. Now, Deborah... A prophetess, the wife of Lapidoth, was judging Israel at that time. She used to sit under the palm of Deborah between Ramah and Bethel in the hill country of Ephraim, and the people of Israel came up to her for judgment. She sent and summoned Barak, the son of Abinoab, from Kadesh Naphtali, and said to him, Has not the Lord, the God of Israel, commanded you? Go! Gather your men at Mount Tabor, taking 10,000 from the people of Naphtali and the people of Zebulun. And I will draw out to Sarah, the general of Jabin's army, to meet you by the river Kishon with his chariots and his troops. And I will give him into your hand. And Barak said to her, if you will go with me, I'll go. But if you will not go with me, I, I, I will not go. And she said, surely I'll go with you. Nevertheless, the road on which you are going will not lead to your glory. For the Lord will sell Sisera into the hand of a woman. Then Deborah rose and went with Barak to Kadesh. And Barak called out Zebulun and Naphtali to Kadesh. And 10,000 men went up at his heels. And Deborah went up with him. So here we have these main characters being introduced. right? We heard from uh, the first three verses of this guy Jabin. He's the one that has all the chariots and his his commander of this army is Sisera, and they're introduced to Deborah. Now, for the last 
two or three people that we've heard that are leading and, and judging. Um, it says that God rose them up, called them up to judge. Here we find that Deborah um, is just doing this. She, she's described as a prophetess. She's a, a wife. She's judging Israel. People would come to her kind of around this tree she sits at and kind of provide judgment, decisions for people. She was probably wise. She was looked up to. Um, even this commander was, was wanting to go to her for some answers. And then we have this commander, Barak. He's the one that's commander of God's armies. And it seems that God has commanded him to go out and lead and fight with his, what, his 10,000 men against this giant army coming after him. And there's this little dialogue right between uh, Deborah and Barak about, um, hasn't God commanded you to do this? Well, I'm not going to go. You don't go, but, but okay, I'm going to go, but you will not get the glory. We'll, we'll, we'll come back to that in a minute, but let's keep reading here. Verse 11. Now Heber the Kenanite had separated from the Kenites, descendants of Hobab, the father-in-law of Moses, and had pitched his tent as far away as the oak of Zananim, which is near Kedesh. Aren't you glad you're not reading these, all these names that I have here? <laughs> Verse 12. When Sisera was told that Barak, the son of Abinoam, had gone out to Mount Tabor, Sisera called out all his chariots, 900 chariots of iron, and all the men who were with him from Harasheth, Hagawim, to River Kishon. Chariots are coming, right? And Deborah said to Barak, up, for this is the day in which the Lord has given Sisera into your hand. Does not the Lord go out before you? So Barak went down from Mount Tabor with 10,000 men following him. And the Lord routed Sisera and all his chariots and all his army before Barak by the edge with the sword. And Sisera got down from his chariot and fled away on foot. And Barak pursued the chariots and the army of Herosheth Hagoim. And all the army of Sisera fell by the edge of the sword. Not a man was left. So here is the great battle that happens. The chariots come out. They're, they're, they're I think, afraid of these chariots of, of iron and the army that comes out. And, and Barak comes up and Deborah goes out and Deborah says, Up, it's time. Asking this great question, does not the Lord go out before you. It's interesting in her leadership here, Deborah keeps asking these questions. Do, doesn't the Lord go up before you? Did, didn't God tell you to go out and do this? There's something interesting about her leadership style as she does that. But there's a message for us here, I think, in the midst of all of these people kind of talking and going out and these chariots of iron. Are we afraid or too timid sometimes by what the world or human eyes can see as terrible or, or, or not good in front of us? Chariots of iron are, are nothing to God. <laughs> Deborah knows this. She's encouraging her, her commander Barak this. But to any of us, that may look like death or certain defeat. But to God, this is nothing. And we're going to see later how they defeated the chariots of iron. It's going to talk about this later. Now, there's something else going on here, I think, between Deborah and Barak. And, and why, why does she kind of keep asking him and, and pleading with him and talking to him? There's, there's some questions by different people here of, should Deborah be doing this? For a lot of the Old Testament, a lot of uh, the first five, six books, we have men who are called out by God, right? We have Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, Moses, Joshua. The, the priests were all men. Sure, there, there's women who did mighty good things, but these leaders, and we're going to see the rest of the book too, a lot of these judges are men. So is she supposed to be doing this? Should she be judging in this time? It, it almost seems like that she's encouraging Barak. Barak, you should be the one doing this. What? God's commanded you to go out and do this. Go out and do it. And Barak seems timid. I'm not going to go unless you go with me. All right, I'll go with you, but you will not get the glory. Now, P. 
people come down different sides of this and say, well, okay, this is, this is saying that women should not lead. Uh, this is saying that, um, uh, you know, she stepped in when, when men were not leading. Or this is saying something different, that she was supposed to lead. This is okay. Even in the, in the New Testament, Barak is talked about as someone who has faith in the book of Hebrews. I think there's a little bit of both going on here. I think Deborah is commended for what she does. She steps up in a time when it seems like nobody else would. Barak's not stepping up. Everyone's afraid of the chariots. So she steps in. She's judging. She is leading. And then Barak finally does what he is called to do, reminded by Deborah that the Lord goes out before. This is the theme we're going to see throughout these two chapters here, that when God calls you to do something, do it. Don't stand back. Don't wait. Don't let somebody else do it. But when God calls you to be the commander, God calls you to be the, the prophetess, God calls you to step up, you should go and do it. And what a comforting thought for us, too, that Deborah says in verse 14, does not the Lord go out before you? I think so many times in our life, we, we can't see what God's doing. We only see the, the bleak, the, the unfortunate, the hard, the chariots. But the thing is that God is always going before us. He's, he's above all time and space and all that. He always knows what is coming next. He is sovereign. He's good. He always goes before us. Well, let's keep reading here. This is now point two. We're going to talk about another woman who steps up, Jael, verse 17. But Sisera fled away on foot to the tent of Jael. He gets away, the wife of Heber the Canaanite. For there was peace between Jabin the king of Hazar and the house of Heber the Canaanite. So verse 11 kind of makes sense now. That's why that was there. There was peace. Here's someone safe. Hopefully they can go to. And Jael came out to meet Sisera and said to him, Turn aside, my lord. Turn aside to me. Do not be afraid. So he turned aside to her into the tent. She covered him with a rug. And he said to her, Please uh, give me a little water to drink for I'm thirsty. She opened a skin of milk and gave him a drink and covered him. And he said to her, stand at the opening of the tent. And if any man comes and asks you, is anyone here? Say no. But Jael, the wife of Heber, took a tent peg and took a hammer in her hand. Then she went softly to him and drove the tent peg into his temple until it went down into the ground while he was lying fast asleep from weariness. So he died. And behold, as Brock was pursuing Sisera, Jael went out to meet him and said to him, Come, and I will show you the man whom you are seeking. So he went into her tent, and there lay Sisera dead with a tent peg in his temple. So on that day, God subdued Jabin, the king of Canaan, before the people of Israel. And the hand of the people of Israel pressed harder and harder against Jabin, the king of Canaan, until they destroyed Jabin, king of Canaan. So Sisera seemingly gets away, he goes to a safe place, he goes to one of their army buddies, friend's house, there's the wife there, J.L., seems like it's a good place to be, and she's very comforting, right? She covers him with a rug, he's, he's thirsty, and she, she kind of mothers him, it seems like, right? She, she covers him up, gives him a rug, uh, she kind of gives him some warm milk to drink, like it's like it's bedtime for him, like almost like she's rocking a baby to sleep, covered up, and just kind of lulling him into, okay, I'm just going to well, comfort you here and go to sleep. And then in this strange twist of just, it seems normal in the book of Judges, she, in her motherly way, takes a tent peg as he's sleeping and jams it through his temple so far that it goes through his head into the ground. I said this last week in the book of uh, Judges, like about Ehud. Like, if you ever think the Bible is boring, this is gross, okay? There's like brains coming out and blood and all kinds of stuff. But we get this thing that, verse 23, so on that day, God subdued Jabin the king. There's something happening here about 
God using these people, he is the one who is sovereign and doing this. He's still in control, even by the hand of a woman who nobody thought in that time could do this. I found that in that time period, usually the people who would make the tents, had the tent pegs, were, were the women. So she, she uses what she has, right? Her mothering skills, her tent peg, to do, I think, what God had called her to do. Again, you see this theme of God calling her to do something. God is in control. He's the one that gets the glory. He subdues him, but she steps in and she helps out and she provides. Now, out of all the crazy things that happen in the book of Judges, uh, there's a story about, there's one little verse about a guy who kills 600 people with like an ox goad, uh, a leader who is a womanizer, uh, this story of Ehud and his, uh, you know, stabbing a guy with a sword that goes into his belly, a, a leader sacrificing their own daughter. Now in chapter 5, we get a musical number. Like, it turns into a song all of a sudden about all of this blood and death. Look at verse 1 in chapter 5. Then sang Deborah and Barak, the son of Abinoam, on that day. So chapter 5 is now this song they sing out to celebrate and to worship God for what he has done. It's almost the theology or the background behind what, what is going on behind this story of Jael and and Brock and, and Deborah and all of these things. Again, look for these themes of chariots and the leaders and people being called to do things. Look at the verse 2 and on. It says, Then the, that the leaders took the lead in Israel, that the people offer themselves willingly. Bless the Lord. Hear, O kings, give ear, O princes. To the Lord I will sing. I will make melody to the Lord, the God of Israel. Lord, when you went out from Seir, when you marched from the region of Edom, the earth trembled and the heavens dropped, yet the clouds dropped water. The mountains quaked before the Lord, even Sinai before the Lord, the God of Israel. In the days of, in the days of Shamgar, son of Anath, in the days of Jael, the highways were abandoned and travelers kept to the byways. The villagers ceased in Israel. They they ceased to be until I arose. I, Deborah, arose as a mother in Israel when new gods were chosen. When, then war was in the gates. Was shield or spear to be seen among 40,000 Israel? My heart goes out to the commanders of Israel who offer themselves willingly among the people. Bless the Lord. Tell of it, you who ride on white donkeys, you who sit on rich carpets, you who walk by the way to the sound of Musicians of the watering places, there they repeat the righteous triumphs of the Lord, the righteous triumphs of his villagers in Israel. Let's pause there for a second. The Bible is so interesting to me because you get not only this, this narrative, storytelling sometimes, of this happened, this is history, this is true, but then you also get poetry or songs. Whenever you see in your Bible, um, if you can see this kind of like indentation or that's it's looking at kind of Hebrew poetry or looking at how it may have looked or sounded in that time period. But they, they want to sing out now about what has happened for the next generation and people after that to understand and to remember what God has done. So let me just point out a few things to you here of what what is in this song that is important for us? Um, first, we get this idea of worship. He's telling them to, or him and Deborah, Barak and Deborah, to, to bless the Lord. Hear, O kings, I'm going to sing. I will make melody to the God of Israel. Repeat these righteous triumphs of the Lord. They're just Bless the Lord in verse 9. They are crying out to worship. They're saying this to leaders, to all kinds of people, to bless the Lord and make melody to the Lord. Earlier, we, we sang three songs. We, we do this every Sunday. We, we sing songs. 
we preach from the word of God, take an offering, we pray, we have community, but worship is an essential part of what we do as a community. One of the cool things that our worship director, Josh, has done over the years is as he's led us in different songs, picking and choosing, he's written a number of his own worship songs. In fact, if you want to go to Spotify and look up Josh Rickraff, he has a song on Spotify. But what a blessing to us that we have someone that can lead us in worship with songs that, you know, have been sung for centuries, new songs, songs that he has written even. Here's just a, a plug too. We were talking this last week, the first Monday in February, we're going to do a little uh, pizza and praise night. Um, and I've asked Josh if he would just do all of his original songs. I mean, not, not all of them, but he has. He has a lot of them. But do original songs for us. So you want to come join us that night just to have pizza and pray and praise God. The second thing I want you to see also is that there's this idea of leaders leading. They're singing about this, and they, they talk in verse 2 about they're, they're praising God that the leaders took the lead in Israel. They're talking to the kings to the princes, even that the people, it says, they offer themselves willingly. There's this sense in these few chapters here that Deborah rose up, Barak finally rose up, Jael rose up in her time, that when leaders lead, it is a good thing. When the people rise up, it is a good thing. This last November, uh, we had one of our staff members Resign, right? Our children's director and high school director. And so for the last few months, we, we've been without them. We had different volunteers and myself kind of stepping in to do the children's ministry. I've been, you know, a lot of your kids through Awana, and we were playing dodgeball this last Wednesday. I get to see, like, who are the kids who are really competitive, who are not, you know, who's good at dodgeball, who's not, all, all kinds of just fun things about being at Awana and kids' ministry, but it's a lot. For a church our size, for the amount of kids that we have, new people, we have a lot of ministry to do here. And I found myself just wondering, even as I'm, <laughs> I'm playing bass, I'm, I'm preaching, I'm leading communion, I was getting kids' ministry set up, I'm not, I'm not trying to complain, I'm just thinking through the things I was doing this morning, have I done a good job of this, of leading you to be this kind of people offering themselves willingly? If God were to kind of assess us and say, yes, we are a church of leaders leading, of doing this, more than just me, and people offer themselves up to, to serve, would God be happy with where we are? Or do we have a lot of people who are on the sidelines and watching? In fact, I, I'd love to you know, hire a, a children's director or a part-time one pretty soon here, but our, our giving has not been great. It doesn't seem like we can do that pretty soon. And so it takes all of us with our giving, with our serving, with staff, with volunteers, elders to come together to lead well. The third thing he shows us in this song, too, is it shows us kind of how God won this battle. We saw it a little bit in verses 4 and 5 as it talks about the earth trembling. The heavens dropped. The clouds dropped water. The mountains quaked before the Lord. And then turn with me a little bit forward too, to verse 19 to 22. The kings came. They fought. Then fought the kings of Canaan at Tanakh by the waters of Megiddo. They got no spoils of silver from heaven. The stars fought from their courses. They fought against the Sarah. The torrent Kishon swept them away. The ancient torrent, the torrent Kishon, march on my soul with might. Then loud beat the hoofs, horse's hooves to the galloping, galloping of his steeds. It seems that God sent rain. In the midst of these terrible chariots of iron that could not be stopped, God flooded the river, the Kishon, sent rain that the chariots couldn't even move through. I mean, Barak didn't do that. Deborah didn't do that. 
Jael didn't do that. That was God defeating, going ahead of them even before they could do anything. Uh, turn with me back to verse 11. Let's kind of read on here, kind of partway through. Then down to the gates marched the people of the Lord. Awake, awake, Deborah, awake, awake. Break out in song. Arise, Barak, lead away your captives, O son of Abinoam. Then down marched the remnant of the noble. The people of the Lord marched down from me against the mighty. From Ephraim, their root, they marched down into the valley. Following you, Benjamin, with your kinsmen from Matur, marched down. You see that marched down, marched down. It's happening all over again here. And from Zebulun, those who bear the lieutenant's staff. So watch these names here. Watch what they do and don't do. The princes of Issachar came with Deborah and Issachar, faithful to Barak, into the valley. They rushed at his heels along the clans of Reuben. They were great searching of heart. But why did you sit still among the sheepfolds to hear the whistling for the flocks? Among the clans of Reuben, there was great searchings of heart. Gilead stayed beyond the Jordan. And Dan, why did, why did he stay with the ships? Asher sat still at the coast of his, the sea, staying by his landings. Zebulun is a people who risked their lives to the death. Naphtali, too, on the heights of the field. There's this singing about those that went with and those who did not. Right there, they're praising those. There's those that went with him that followed Deborah and Barak. There's this marching. They're going after Ephraim is coming. Benjamin's coming. Zebulun's coming. Naphtali's coming. But then there's these others. Reuben, he searched his heart. They're all they're just searching. They're thinking about it. They're really searching their heart. It talks about it over and over again, but then they don't do anything. Gideon, Dan, Asher, again, they just stay behind. Again, this theme of will you go when God calls you? And finally, we get this comparison between these two women. Look at verse 24 with me, and we'll finish this up. Most blessed of women be Jael, the wife of Heber the Kenite, of tent-dwelling women most blessed. He asked for water, and she gave him milk. She brought him curds and a noble's bowl. She sent her hand to the tent peg and her right hand to the workman's mallet. She struck Sisera. She crushed his head. She shattered and pierced his temple. Between her feet he sank, he fell, he lay still. Between her feet he sank, he fell. Where he sank, there he fell dead. Out of the window she peered. The mother of Sisera wailed through the lattice. Why is his chariot so long in coming? Why tarry the hoofbeats of his chariots? Her wisest princess's answer. Indeed, she answers herself, have they not found and divided the spoil? A womb or two for every man. Spoil of dyed materials for Sisera. Spoil of dyed materials embroidered. Two pieces of dyed work embroidered for the neck as spoil. So may all your enemies perish, O Lord. But your friends, for the sun as he rises in his might. And the Lord had rest for 40, the land had rest for 40 years. There's this comparison with two women at the end. Jael, her mallet wielding tent peg, and this poetry that happens about her and how her being blessed by the Lord. And then this, again, back to chariots, the mother of Sisera looking and crying out, where, where are the chariots? Why aren't they coming? She trusts in what she can see and hoping that her son will come home. It ends with this line, so may all your enemies perish, O Lord, but your friends, for the son as he rises in his might. To close up these two chapters here, thinking about these different people of Deborah and Barak and Sisera and Jael, all these people that God uses or shows his glory through by defeating. My question, my, my encouragement to let to leave with you is when God calls you to, to stand up, to, to fight, what will you do? Will you tremble and be afraid like some of them were, like Barak? Or, or will you trust in your chariots of iron? Or will you trust in God knowing that he is the one that goes up before you? Uh, women who are out there, we have some great examples here of 
of women stepping up, being prophetesses, judging, doing what God called them to do. Man, rise up. When God tells you, go take this next hill, follow through. And that line there, but your friends, O Lord, be like the sun as he rises in his might. And the land had rest for 40 years. I pray that is true for you, that you have rest with God in the future. And because of Christ, you can call him a friend. Let's pray. Father, you use men and women in mighty ways to do your work. You use people like Deborah and Barack to protect your people, to subdue enemies. Even when it seems terrible and we're outmatched and the devil seems strong, God, you, you do a work in our life that just seems unbelievable. And I pray that, God, you'd open our eyes, help us to trust and believe that miracles can still happen even today. Father, when we are called to step up, whether it's a spiritual battle or a battle against our own emotions, our own thoughts. Maybe it's a battle we're facing at work or at home, that God, you would go before us. You would lead the path forward for us. You would make us strong, trusting in you, that you are the one who fights for us. Father, we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.